of the Google community at the time when the DAO was starting. Okay, quite a few. Uh, so the DAO was probably like the first interesting big experiment on Ethereum. And what made, what made it so interesting was that it was the first time in history that an organization was created where over 11,000 people were participating in order to collect money and create um, yeah, this venture capital fund. And this without any, any employees working for this organization, any like legal costs you would otherwise have in order to try to create such a global organization. And I think it showed for the first time in history like what can be done uh, with blockchain and what the real power is, which is coordinating people to achieve common goals. So this was a super exciting experiment. Maybe it was a bit too exciting in the end. Um, but it really showed what the potential of Ethereum is. And we were asking ourselves, like, what would have happened if this experiment would not have failed? So probably the DAO would have been a very powerful funding mechanism for projects. We have seen after the DAO that there was well, lots of ICO craziness, lots of people investing money in all kinds of projects, um, lots of scams happening. If the DAO would have existed, probably there would have been less scams because the DAO could have been a very clear signal to legitimize other projects that want to raise funds. Now, a couple of years have passed, and we believe it's time again to start another DAO. Not exactly the same like the DAO, but with a different context. So let me explain. But with a different context. So let me explain what we want to do. So we want to start the DX DAO. The DX DAO is an infrastructure component on Ethereum, which will allow to govern decentralized applications on Ethereum. So you may wonder, the apps, they are decentralized. Why do you need a DAO? So any more, a bit more complex the app today on Ethereum is in fact not decentralized. The most intro, like the most popular the app today, we can say is probably Maker, Maker DAO. And Maker DAO, for example, depends on an S and a It depends on an USD uh, price fee, which is essentially maintained by a simple multisig. So the decentralized, it's not really truly decentralized because there's still this one simple multisig where very few owners control the most crucial part of the system. And the same is true for all those systems that have, for example, upgradability. You know, there's no, it's always one central which defines Alternative is, okay, well, we say we don't want to have this responsibility and we just don't make the system upgradable, but then the only way to upgrade the system is to actually do a fork, which requires all users participating in the system to also detect. And to start this experiment, we will move the control of our own decentralized exchange protocol, the Dutch X, into the hands of this DAO. So, the Dutch exchange is interesting because it is the only truly decentralized exchange today on Ethereum. Why? Because most exchanges, decentralized, so-called decentralized exchange on Ethereum today, they, have, they require off-chain components, like for example an order book, which is maintained by the central service. Now, so, for example, IDEX, Oasis Dex, they all have centralized components, and that's why none of them actually really centralized. The Dutch exchange doesn't have this. The Dutch exchange is uh, an exchange that works without order book. It works with Dutch auctions. Also like that Algorand <laughs> apparently going to use Dutch auctions. Um, and I'm not talking about the Dutch exchange today. If you're interested in it, last year 
I gave a talk here also at the Ethereum meetup in London uh, about the dust exchange. So again, what's the motivation here? The motivation is that we are able to create decentralized applications and still allow a group of or like this organization to govern this application. This is important because then we remove the last central point of failure in those systems, which is us, you know, us companies, uh, or us noses, um, and also users that are participating in those systems, they get they can get ownership in those DAOs in order to govern those. So they feel more represented in this and they feel more aligned with the interests of this application that they want to use. <coughs> so in order to create such a DAO, you have to have some sort of governance system. And we, in Gnosis, we decided to, to go with a company called DAOSTEC. So there are several DAOs being implemented right now. Aragon is the prominent example. DAOSTEC is another. The reason why we went with DAOSTEC is because we want to create a scalable organization. Meaning, we want to have as many participants as possible being part of this organization. Because only then we can make the claim that it is actually decentralized. So what is the problem with large organizations? The problem is that you cannot easily come to decisions. Right? If you have 10 people in the room, you probably easily can come to a decision uh, by just requiring an absolute majority. If five people have to say they want to do something, then it's fine. But if you scale up to like 100 or 1,000, then requiring a big majority is actually not easy because it requires a lot of coordination. I can just tell by my own experience, uh, we are also part of the WBDC DAO, uh, which is essentially just a multisig, uh, a local multisig on Ethereum, and it takes forever to coordinate those 10 parties in this multisig to sign transactions. So it's already not scalable anymore. So what you need is something that allows to have a large group of people being responsible and can participate if they want. And you have to make sure that this organization can still make a lot of decisions, but making sure that very few people cannot make decisions at the expense of everyone else in the organization. And that's exactly what the RSTAC is about. The RSTAC um, works like the following. They have the holographic consensus framework. And if you want to make proposals in this DAO, what you do is, you are submitting a proposal and then in order to make a proposal uh, um, to approve the proposal you need an absolute majority by default but it is applied for attention in this, in this organization so if you if you want to uh, decide on proposals then you know all people in this organization have only limited time in order to read those proposals actually being able to judge for, judge if this proposal is valid or not. And to make sure that only those proposals which are actually relevant get people's attention and can be voted on, the whole graphic consensus framework introduces a prediction game where anyone can bet that the proposal will be accepted. So it's bit similar to a prediction market, it's not yet a prediction market, eventually it will turn into a prediction market, but essentially uh, anyone who owns those gen tokens, which is the intrinsic token of DAO stack, uh, can use those tokens to bet on yes, the proposal will be accepted or no, it won't be. And once the uh, betting volume on the proposal reaches a, a certain threshold, once there's enough money at stake, the proposal is so-called boosted proposal is boosted, which means that by now only a relative majority is required in order to, uh, yeah, to approve this proposal. And now you can say, okay, someone who has a lot of a lot of gen tokens, they can just boost lots of proposals. So ultimately there might be like hundreds of boosted proposals and for the organization it might still be impossible to actually read all of them and then someone might be successful with a malicious proposal. And in order to prevent this, the threshold in order to boost a proposal goes up with any already boosted proposals. 
So the more boosted proposals there are, the more expensive it gets to actually boost the proposal to uh, move in the state where just a relative majority is required in order to <coughs> Yeah, and this is just the boosting process. So you know, can be a majority if uh, no one is boosting it or a relative, uh, or a relative majority if it has been boosted. And then people can start voting on it. And for this, it's required and those so-called rep tokens are required. The rep tokens are the voting rights in a DAO stack organization. And anyone can uh, yeah, participate in this vote. And in case uh, the proposal finally gets accepted, meaning that um, uh, the, it was voted for yes for a, several, for a period of time without changing the front runner, meaning without a change in uh, the decision process to be accepted yes or no. If there is a change in the very end, then the period will be extended until we come to a decision. But once this is approved, then those which predicted or which voted that this will be approved will gain more reputation, and those that predicted it will not be approved, they lose a bit of reputation. So this is the way all the organization will try to balance itself out, such that those that are um, yeah, are actually really uh, voting and making right for like votes which are as you believe it to votes which are accepted gain more reputation over time. So you may wonder like is this actually interesting? Uh, what can a DAO actually do today? So on the theory of the DAO is in itself just a smart contract. And smart contracts are first class business on a theory meaning they can do anything that also a yeah, private key or account can do. And that's quite a lot. So you can basically do any kind of transaction on the Ethereum network. And if you think about like what's currently centralized, then one part that's basically centralized for all the apps is the UI. And the UI is served by the central service, your server. Uh, and that's something that the DAO can actually own. Uh, because now the DAO could basically control uh, an DNS entry pointing uh, to an IDNS object which contains UI and allows anyone to uh, interact with the decentralized application. Owning this entry also allows to then upgrade UI. And suddenly you have decentralized organization which can control the protocol, it can control the UI, uh, and yeah, allows uh, to do all those upgrades. Um, that are approved by the community. <coughs> DAO can also tweet. There's a solution on, on a few business. Tweet, uh, this is a kind of social network similar to Twitter, but running really centralized. The DAO could engage also in marketing activities. Um, and yeah. One super exciting part is also um, acting as a dispute resolution oracle. So, uh, oracles are crucial, especially also for example for prediction markets. Uh, this DAO could serve as an oracle for prediction markets. It could serve also as um, this resolution in case, for example, someone uh, is giving access to one of their accounts and the order like this DAO could serve as the last resort to resolve if, uh, if the transaction should be done or not. What the DAO cannot do today, and uh, there's no solution to yet, is of course if, uh, if there's anything off chain that it can access, like um, in, in, in contributions to assets which are basically outside the blockchain, because it's not a legal entity, so it cannot handle those kinds of assets. So, to start with, we give the DAO one asset, which is the Dutch exchange. And the Dutch exchange is itself also a smart contract which allows, for example, to upgrade the system. And so basically, the, the smart contract system is designed in a way that um, there is a proxy contract which is pointing to the logic, and this proxy can be updated to point to a different logic, which essentially means that you upgrade the logic of the exchange itself. Now, the DAO will be in control over the permission to upgrade and change the parameters of the system. Meaning, it can upgrade the system, 
It can change parameters of the system, and everything is transparent because the process involves obviously always this proposal phase, the um, yeah the uh, uh, voting phase, etc. Until finally this change can be applied. If you look at uh, existing systems out there, for example, uh, Augur. Augur is uh, yeah, a very complex British market system which cannot be easily upgraded. So in case there has to be an upgrade, then actually everyone has to uh, act and go to the next system. And that is an example. This can involve quite some security concerns as well. So for example, in, in, uh, in August states, what happens is that you as a user have to decide if you're on one system or the other, so you have to transfer basically. And now, lots of people were transferring, but there's still a lot of markets that have to be resolved in the old system. And suddenly there are very few people that are responsible for resolving markets in the old system, making it way more uh, easy to manipulate. If you have a system where you know you can just upgrade the smart contract without changing the addresses of those smart contracts, that's a very important <coughs> mechanism to have. Yeah, so um, obviously this DAO is only uh, the DAO is only starting with the Dutch exchange. We expect there will be many more possible applications that want to transfer ownership over the decentralized protocols to the Dutch exchange, uh, sorry, to the, to the TXDAO. Uh, simply for that reason, um, because if they don't, then it will just not be decentralized. So, and of course this DAO, because it can have a life on its own, can do whatever the members want, it might decide to also just basically deploy systems that are already in place to make them actually decentralized. So yeah, there's basically no real limit to it. I think there's a, a we think there's a really big need in order to make it fully really decentralized, especially now you see lots of applications are facing issues which are related to centralization, like IDEX has to introduce KYC and AML. Uh, because they have those offline components, they have to, uh, they have, they have, they, which are under, under their control. And yeah, any protocol which actually aims to be fully centralized, um, but still wants to be flexible, will have to uh, yeah, start moving over to such a system. <laughs> Setting up such a system is very hard, because you need enough people to participate. And if you want to make this experiment successful, then we will need as many people, basically you guys, to participate as well. And the way how this works is that we have the initial distribution phase of reputation, meaning <coughs> voting rights in this organization. And there are basically four ways how you can, or like five ways how you can participate. The easiest way is to basically lock down tokens that you have. There's only one requirement, that this token is also traded and whitelisted on the Dutch exchange. So the Dutch exchange again is like fully decentralized, so permissionless, anyone can add tokens to the Dutch exchange. So if you are uh, interested in whitelisting a token, uh, like staking a token which is not yet on that exchange, you can just add it yourself. There's just one requirement we have to the whitelist because we have to ensure that no one's adding a token which is kind of like a malicious token where he owns 100% of the supply and can basically manipulate the system. Uh, yeah. Uh, did I take some questions or do I Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, okay. I'll just shortly wrapping it up. So you can also, you can also, uh, they either and an alternative is that you, or the biggest part of your rotation is to those trading on the Dutch exchange. The Dutch exchange itself has a mining token, meaning like for every trade you do, for instance, you get a mining token for Magnolia. And uh, basically at the end of the period, you can use those tokens to stake those Magnolia tokens to get also reputation in this organization.
questions? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry to wrap this up. Yeah, it's okay. okay. Maybe it's yeah. just showing the blurry line here. Um, yeah. Is there any more and more attention for this? Um, if you're interested, join this. Uh, and I'll have to take questions. Okay. Uh, just Uh, one quick question first, really cool that you're doing this experiment, uh, really cool to see a proper decentralized application taking off. Uh, my question is more focused around the exchange. You mentioned there's no centralized password like the order book. Uh, how do you solve the problem of the latency of settlement if there's no centralized password? Yeah, so this exchange has a very long latency, basically six hours. The way it works is like anyone who wants to sell tokens is finding an auction. And the auction actually takes six hours on average to complete. Um, it's, this is way we can ensure that there's also enough breeding liquidity on the other side in order to uh, yeah, basically match the sell supply um, at the time when the price is crossing the market price. That's so true. Intentionally slow at the moment at least. Yeah. Awesome. Um, with regards to the voting process, um, what is the incentive for someone to participate and what is the quorum required to pass a proposal? Like, I mean, considering that it's on-chain, it's likely going to cost you know, a couple of cents, but also the coordination, getting everyone to come on, on, online. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, you can expect that there will be more and more organizations transferring ownership to this. And then the question is, okay, if you offer governance, there has to be something in return. And it might be, it's not up to me or Gnosis to decide, but it might be, for example, the DAO will, will suggest that the percentage of the fee generated on the exchange that it governs is then contributed to this organization. Or like an Oracle service, obviously this would not come for free, but the DAO could ask the fee for this kind of service. And I think once we have actually the, the community organized and coordinated, then Possibilities may go way beyond that. It is just like a very obvious need that there is right now for some protocols, and that's why we hope it's possible for us to coordinate enough people around this um, to achieve this goal. But then, well, possibilities are endless once we have something that works. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's one topic, one uh, key piece of functionality that uh, I was. Uh, kind of missing throughout the talk, and I was waiting you would come to that, uh, so perhaps you can say something to it, which is censorship resistance. How do we ensure that people in oppressive countries, uh, or is a situation where a country that is initially um, normal and accepting and then comes out with some uh, very, um, very um, restrictive uh, regulations trying to suffocate the, the crypto space, all DAOs for, for that matter. How do you ensure from a technical perspective that the system is censorship resistant? Yeah, so obviously, like, we can only assume, or we, right now we would say, Ethereum itself is censorship resistant. Um, of course, people participating in this DAO eventually you might be able to identify specific addresses to specific people, and it might be. Uh, that is in certain states, you could try to get after those. There are something, there's something <coughs> out right now. At some point, eventually, technology will be ready to uh, make this easier. Right now, I would not claim it is, like Ethereum has for the Um For, uh, yeah, that's, that's something basically we cannot ensure right now. But what helps a lot is if you have lots of people participating. So if you have organization where there are thousands of people, then it will be much more difficult to yeah, basically uh, point out very few people that you go after. Okay, guys, we're going to leave it there. Give a round of applause.